Wagner, thanks for coming back and uh, talking to us again today. It's nice to see you for so a change. It, <laughs> you, you as well. And, uh, you know, we, we're moving from audio to video, so we're getting closer to real life. It's a step at a time to what uh, what we're used to and what we really want, which is to be in the room together, which That's I think right. is what everybody wants right now is to be in the room with the people that they care about and to have those conversations without worry. Yeah, no, that's right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, we'll get there. We'll get there. We'll get there. And this is pretty good. So thanks. <laughs> My pleasure. We're going to talk about a, a, a post, a, some writing that you've done on Uncommon Wisdom about is that this post is called swimming upstream and it gets to this idea that we're seeing in our in our uh, communities here in South Dakota and then nationwide with this idea of defunding the police or even abolishing the police or um, reforming the police and and as we have this language this is the first year that I recollect where so much of that language has been tied to the purse strings um, in previous uh, previous conversations, I can recall a lot of talking about training, you know, additional training and some racial bias training. But this is the first time I can recall people holding signs saying, you know, essentially take away their funding and uh, make them all go home. We are very divided on this issue here at home and around the country. So when you think of the word defund the police, um, what comes to mind? To you, does that feel like a, a useful, <laughs> a useful label to talk about what we really need to be talking about? Well, you know, it, it's. Uh, I think it's. I think it's a, a, an horrific use of rhetoric. Um, you know, now on on one hand, it, I could argue it's an effective use of rhetoric because, to your point, Lori, it's the first time that this conversation about reforming community policing. Um, has been tied to money. And sadly, once you start pulling the financial strings, once you start threatening someone's budget, you get people's attention. And so I have to give a little bit of credit, I guess, to the to the phrase defund the police. It has certainly stirred the passions and it has it has um, raised the the visibility, if you will, of this discussion. So that's probably a, a good thing. Um, the bad thing about the rhetoric defund the police is it, I think, has pushed uh, people into corners, you know, so now we have the stand with the blue movement, you know, that I'm all in favor of, of spending more money on the police. And, and so in some ways, this defunding has almost um, overshot the goal. It has gotten so much attention because of the purse strings that now it now people are taking it literally. Do we want to take all the money away from the police? Do we want to give them more money? And and I don't think that's what the real debate is about or should be about. And yet it has inflamed these emotions. So again, good news. Uh, people are talking about uh, community policing. Bad news is um, it has raised the, the the conflict to an intolerable point. And everybody thinks it's about whether I support my local police or whether I, I don't support them. And, and that's not a very useful framework. Yeah. And, and when we talk about uncommon wisdom, this is a, this is a leadership question as well. So that, you know, these questions about budgets are being put to mayors and police chiefs and lawmakers. And it's a leadership moment and people in business is a leadership moment for anybody who is making decision about decisions about funding and about training and about what we can do to make our communities healthier. So when we look at the uncommon wisdom of this, where do you wanna begin with that seed of defunding the police and, and grow it into something different in a more right. useful direction? Well, the, the, the term that, that I've coined is what I call pre-funding the police. Because if, if you listen to the most thoughtful thinkers, uh, you know, the most uh, thoughtful leaders who are talking about defund the police, reform the, our police departments, um, I think what you'll really hear is that a lot of what police do um, is not necessarily about, um, you know, violence and so forth. They're taking care of, I mean, it can be violent, don't get me wrong, but the, the problems that they're addressing um, are, are social problems. 
family conflicts, poverty, um, drug addiction, and the, the police uh, become the last line of defense, or in some cases, the only line of defense. You know, I've got a neighbor who's on drugs and causing problems, so I call the police. There's nothing else to be done. And what really thoughtful leaders, I think, are trying to say with this defund the police is they're actually saying, let's pre-fund this community need. And that's the term I like to use. Let's move money upstream that if some of our police are, are forced to intervene uh, in addiction problems, how do we address the addiction problems where they're occurring? Uh, people becoming addicted to drugs or people uh, currently addicted to drugs that need social support and social help. Um, if you think about it, um, you know, calling the police is, is, a, is a pretty aggressive um, and temporary step. You know, the police come in and, you know, they might take somebody to the emergency room or they might break up a fight or, or get, but, but they're not really well equipped um, to permanently or to significantly deal with the social problems that are often at the root of, of what they're dealing with. It's funny, I was at a meeting uh, in the Black Hills uh, about a week ago, and it was a community neighborhood meeting and what have you, and people were talking about gravel and the roads and you know kids speeding on the roads, and somebody said, well, we need the sheriff to be uh, more present. And the comment that came back is that the sheriff's department uh, does not, uh, in western South Dakota, doesn't have enough funding to, um, you know, patrol neighborhoods because they're spending so much time intervening in domestic um, abuse situations. And so here you have, you know, rural America, rural South Dakota, western South Dakota, and the number one issue, you know, of, of one sheriff's department is domestic, uh, domestic conflict. I had a, another sheriff in Eastern South Dakota who I was at a, a Kiwanis program. And he said, you know, uh, meth is the number one problem that the county faces. And this is a county of, you know, 10,000 people. And, and meth addiction is the number one problem. So again, I, I think the, the conversation needs to be about pre-funding our social concerns that rather than, you know, Yes, using the police as the last line of defense, what do we actually need to do upstream in order to really solve the social problems that are manifested by a phone call to the police? Yeah. And so it's, a, it's about moving money. And this does take leadership because leaders have to say, look, what we're doing doesn't seem to work, right? Classic definition of insanity. We can spend more money on more police, but, but is that really going to solve the the social problems, the broken families, the domestic violence, uh, poverty issues, elderly at home alone, whatever the case may be. And how do we move money um, upstream so that we solve these problems before you ever have to call 911? And it seems to me it doesn't always have to be money, although money is an important part of this conversation. When you mentioned domestic violence, I think of every time I go to the doctor and they say, do you feel safe at home? Um, I don't know if that happens to everyone. I think it's part of the protocol at, uh, at the clinic that, I'm, that I go to. And I don't know, I've always felt safe at home, so I don't know what would happen, but I understand that they would have protocol that they would follow, that that's a safe place if you're in the doctor's office as a you know, person in a domestic partnership to be able to say, no, I, I don't feel safe at home and, and, here's, and here's why. So as far as I know, that doesn't cost any money to ask that question. Although you would wonder what happens next as far as connecting people with resources versus never asking that question and then only answering the 911 call when there's a situation of abuse. Right, right. Um, yeah, I, we, we have a, a little bit of a funny story about that very question. Uh, my, <laughs> wife, my wife fell down and broke her kneecap uh, a couple of years ago and we had to go to the emergency department and I'm standing in the room next to my wife and and uh, the, the person asks, you know, do you feel safe at home? And I started to laugh because I said, <laughs> I'm not sure I should be in the room for this conversation. You know? so, but, um, but no, but, but to your point, you know, Lori, there's been a lot of programs around the, the country where um, churches have been empowered, uh, community clubs have been empowered, um, you know, 
uh, at no cost, at absolutely no cost to um, the local government or a very minimal cost, but getting these agencies involved or these, these uh, social organizations, churches, et cetera, involved to start asking those questions and to start identifying where the, where the problems are. And, and this raises the largest issue that, that if, you, if you can get away from the defund versus prefund, you can also get away from the, uh, that this is a police problem. Um, it's a it's a social problem, and I would argue that there are other services that we should consider pre-funding. Healthcare is a classic example, where when you look at the national statistics, um, about three or four percent of the of the population drives about seventy percent of medical costs. And yet, when you talk to the experts, what do we need to do for that three to four to five percent of the vulnerable sick population? It's almost never healthcare. It's nutrition. It's um, safety at home. Uh, it's you know uh, social isolation. The lack of interaction. Um, and there are some really interesting interventions that can be made um, that, to your point, cost almost nothing but strengthen that social that social fabric um, upstream, and and you eliminate the need for high cost medical care or eliminate the need for high cost policing services or what have you. So I would venture to say that if we move some money upstream, there'd be, a, and, and this is the problem, you might have to keep the police force in place as it is today and then create some money upstream, but then, then downstream you're able to take that money away. So I think there's an initial problem in society that we have to truly pre-fund the intervention upstream, eliminate the, the need first, and then you can defund downstream. And that's, that's part of the problem is that you know, it's really hard to make that transition. This should make perfect sense to people now during the pandemic, though, as we've looked at you know, federal stimulus money or in, in employment insurance, uh, you know, uh, supplements, that the whole concept of that is has from the very beginning been we can't let all these people lose their jobs. We, you know, the PPP program uh, for payroll protection was a federal program designed to keep people off the un unemployment rolls. Many people are there anyway. The federal government gave them extra money designed to keep them off of food stamps and out of bankruptcy. It's all happening, this desire to make things happen upstream. We're kind of living this history and paying really close attention to it, and it's come home for many of us right now. No, that, that, that's, that's exactly right. And again, it's, it was, uh, to your point, it was early, it was quick intervention. You know, it's, it's how, do we, um, how do we stop the, the downstream problem from happening? Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, the, the whole public health issue, you know, uh, the, I think it's fascinating that, at least what I read, if people washed their hands, um, that would be the, the best single intervention to stop not just COVID, but to stop, um, corona, you know, uh, to stop norovirus, to stop the flu, the common cold. And uh, so I, it's, I, have a, I have a pet project that I've been talking to people about, that if we want to keep our restaurants in business, why don't we have sinks at the front of restaurants? Mm -hmm. You know, it's interesting, right? We welcome hundreds of strangers to our, our dinner tables in restaurants, and yet um, nobody washes their hands before they, they eat. I mean, one or two might go off to the bathroom. Whereas, you know, I've seen some public facilities, hospitals, where the very first thing you have at the front door are, is hand washing. So again, you're right. It's uh, that the public health issue should also teach us that if we can stay healthy, we're not going to have downstream hospital costs. If we can wash our hands, we're not going to get infected. It, it's all the exact same logic. That's yeah. Right. And this doesn't seem a difficult thing. To, I keep looking for for people who are installing sinks at the, you know, at the department store, at the restaurant. Nobody's doing it, Mike Wagner. <laughs> I know, I know, I tried. It's such a brilliant idea. Does. We're not done. We're gonna keep talking about giving people a place to wash their hands because it's visible. You see right. it, it becomes part of the culture. I mean, if you walk into a grocery store and there's hand sanitizer and masks at the front door, they are setting a 
an intention there at that moment to say, this is important before you come in, do these two things. And um, yeah, it will make a difference. Yeah, no, that that's right. The, the, there's, um, of all my travels, there, there was a hospital I visited in, in uh, Shannon, Ireland. And sure enough, they had a, they, uh, it was a modern hospital, but they had a, a revolving door that you went through. And when you uh, entered, you were in a glass vestibule that an entire waiting room could see you walk into the hospital. And there were glass sinks, you know, the kind of beautiful glass sinks that just sit on the, you know, yeah. and everybody washed uh, their hands when they came in and everybody watched you wash them. <laughs> um, and, you know, and, and you're right, it became the, it became the social norm mm -hmm. that in this hospital, we don't let people in without following the number one basic rule of, of healthcare and sanitation. And so again, I, I think it's interesting, restaurants have been at the epicenter of pain for this uh, coronavirus, right? Um, and yet, interestingly enough, uh, restaurants are not um, set up for public sanitation. They're set up in their kitchens to make food clean but they're not set up to make the dining area clean. And so again, a little bit of intervention up front can go a long way. Yeah. You talk about pre-funding college graduation. Tell, let's talk education for a while and how, how funding things upstream makes a difference. Well, and, and you know, pre-funding of education, again, you know, uh, educators will tell you that simple things like uh, whether a child has had breakfast um, will determine whether they learn, you know, whether they stay focused. It, it's fascinating to me that as we have shut schools down, the one thing that we've been using the school buildings for is just in cities across the country is distributing of food, right? Um, and so if you want a child to be successful, you know, making sure that they're well fed, making sure that, um, you know, they've got some basic um, upfront supplies, making sure they have a safe place to go after school. All the, you know, and again, there are programs that that help with this, but um, I I think oftentimes we underspend on those programs, and then we expect the teacher to somehow fill the gap. And and so the 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 commonality that you're seeing in policing, medical care, education, is we use our most expensive and our most skilled workforce, teachers, doctors, police officers, um, we, we use that workforce to solve problems that upstream social support, upstream you know, community networking, upstream nutritional support could solve. And so in some ways, we wait for the crisis to happen and then we sort of wait for the, the professionals to come in and solve the crisis rather than uh, moving, again, some of those resources, some of that attention upstream and, and solving the, the problem. You know, uh, college graduation rates are, are horrible. Uh, the dropout rates are high. A lot of people start college and drop out. And when you interview them, there are the, the usual suspects if it's too expensive or what have you. Very few people drop out because it's too hard. Very few mm. people drop out because I can't do the work. A lot of people drop out because they don't have childcare. Um, and think what that does. I don't have childcare today, so I can't go to school. I can't go to school, so I can't get a better job. I can't get a better job, which will pay for childcare or whatever. Or even I get a better job and that pays more taxes in the future <laughs> that, can, that can help, you mm. know. And so... Um, we, we, we sort of starve those simple interventions up front and then we pay for it in the back end. It's, it's what I like to call the hidden tax, right? Mm -hmm. Is that we, we don't fund these things up front. And again, there's often a lack of political and community uh, willingness to do that because it's not a crisis yet, you know, and it's very easy for us to say, well, you know, any good parent would feed their child breakfast. It's very easy to be judgmental on those upfronts. Grandson should go visit grandmother, you know, and yet grandson doesn't. And so as a result, grandma becomes lonely uh, or what have you, or single mom drops out of school and, and, and we don't connect the dots that that lack of caring and investment upfront when it's not a crisis, 
right? Mm -hmm. When you can easily brush it off, that the failure for us to address those issues causes huge problems downstream. Is this also where the sort of systemic problems come from, that the people who are left behind by not having some of those upstream services, the people who could be helped the most by them are people who make less money or people who have less education or are people in black and brown communities where we're seeing some of the systemic racism that we saw in policing. Um, talk about that upstream conversation before there's a problem. Is there just a certain amount of blame or willful ignorance or fear? What's kind of driving this idea that um, it's okay to push those services down the road there because I won't need them or is it, well, we'll just never have enough money to pay for all this. Like what's kind of, you know, what do you think is sort of behind some of those decisions? Um, there's, there, there are, there's very clearly um, um, a, a situation of, of society wide, um, you know, bias and, and, and privilege and what have you that that's getting a lot of press these days. Um, and so there's there's a lot of our, a lot of our institutions are sort of hardwired, if you will, for um, you know for the successful, not for the not for the struggling. Um, I think then that it gets into a situation of just lack of um, a, a lack of, of 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 people being able to put themselves in other people's shoes. You know, I worked hard to get ahead. Why can't you? You know, and um, you know, I I know full well that, you know, when I when I was young and I had no money and what have you, um, at the same time I had some friends who helped me get a job and and you know I I don't believe there's any such thing as the self-made person that all of us get a, a hand up or a, um, a little bit of a boost or a good recommendation or what have you, but there is sort of this this sense of well I worked hard. You know, you shouldn't get something for free, and there's this sense of of fairness or inequality that I think kicks in, and that's because again, the the, the person who has had the advantage doesn't actually know what it's like to live without the advantage, you know, and so there is a I I, I don't think it's um, I don't think it's necessarily um, evilly intended if that's a word, uh, you know, it's not a it's not a malicious thinking like you're not worthy of help. It's that, well, you shouldn't need help. Uh, this shouldn't be necessary. Families shouldn't break up. And I think that's that becomes another issue of social problems is it's very easy to judge. You know, you shouldn't get addicted to drugs. Um, you shouldn't beat your spouse. If you, if you are beaten by your spouse, you shouldn't stay home. You know, so there, there's a lot of judgment because there's a lot of belief, I think, uh, sort of an embedded belief that, well, somebody just needs to take action and they can solve their own problem. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think that's fair um, because again, a, a lot of individuals are trapped in their circumstances or they don't know what they don't know to get out of their circumstances. They can't afford to get out of their circumstances. Um, I remember during the, the Me Too movement when that first you know, was something we're just starting to talk about on the show, talking to a, a fair number, not on the program, but off the record of, of older women who were hearing some of these stories, and by older, I mean, you know, 60s and their 70s, hearing stories of these 20-year-olds and saying to me, what are they complaining about? That's just, of course that happens. That's just like, you know, it was almost like they thought that's just part of being a woman in society is that you would get grabbed and you would get passed over for promotion. And, and it was weird for me in sort of this middle generation to look at these older women and say, but don't you want it to be different for these people? You have the experience that will help them. And some of them were just not able to see beyond that and just say, well, that happened to me. So it's going to happen to you. Get over it. And the young yeah. women were saying, uh, this is called, you know, misogyny and we need to be addressing it openly. And, and how are the way, what are the ways that we're going to do that? I, and I think part of the problem, and, and, and I think you see this with people saying, you know, like, look, I never got help. My life matters. Um, you know, that was just the way it was when I was young, all those things. I think there's an inherent fear that a lot of people have that if you, if you somehow discount your life experience, 
You know, if you say, gee, I had it easier than you, or gee, I didn't stand up and fight for women's rights, you know, back in 1930, you know, or what have you. I think there's a, I think there's a psychological reality that takes over that somehow people feel that, that, that devalues them. I should have, you know, that, that for me to admit that women should not suffer, that means that I didn't stand up when I was young. I didn't have the courage. Or if, if I admit that, you know what, I had it easier than some people getting through school. Um, you know, I mean, and, and I worked my way through school. I, I could tell a, a story of, you know, I had to go to night school and I had to pay for my own classes. At the same time, I grew up in a home of, you know, highly educated parents and I had good vocabulary and good speaking skills and good success. And, and for me, all of a sudden to say, you know what, I had it easier than everybody else. I think a lot of people would, would feel like that somehow devalues me. Yeah. And so yeah. there's this, there's this uh, I think there's this overwhelming feeling that, well, you know, my life matters. I matter. I worked hard. I, I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to say that any of that is untrue. And I think a lot of people face this um, cognitive dissonance that if I say you shouldn't suffer that, then somehow that doesn't match my reality and, and my story is not as valuable as your story. And I think that's where people push back, you know, because everybody, everybody wants to matter and everybody wants to feel important. And I think there's a, it's a false trade-off. Um, you know, just like you don't have to criticize someone for you to feel good about yourself, you don't have to um, tell somebody else that they have to struggle in order for you to feel good about about yourself either. Yeah, and the and the cost of those credits when you went to college, and when I went to college versus the cost of those credits when my daughter's going to college. That I mean, that just blows me away well, what they're expected and, to pay. No, and, and no, that's right. That's exactly right. If we and and again, all of us are are heavily influenced by our personal experience right right <laughs> you know so you know i always wonder why my kids don't let their kids walk to school like i used to walk you know because right. yeah that's what everybody did and, and mm -hmm. yeah there's uh, we, we are heavily influenced by our by our own life experience and by our, our own perception and again i think a lot of people um feel that well if i validate something that's different from my experience that somehow I'm devaluing my experience. Right. And um, the opposite really should be true. The opposite should be, I recognize I should not have had to do what I did or that it should have been you know, um, as easy for you as it is for me. And in fact, we should, take, we should actually take pride and confidence uh, that we should be able to learn from our own experience and improve the lives of those around us. Um, you know, it's interesting. Most people want their children to have it easier, to have a better, to have a, 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 a greater path in life than they experienced as a parent. And yet we don't seem to be able to transfer that same passion to the community writ large. So we, we want our own kids to, to have cheaper college. We want our own kids, you know, to, to have a better life than we had. But somehow we struggle with that when it when it becomes the larger community. Yeah, I want to I want to get back to this um, swimming upstream conversation a little bit with this idea of of how to move forward. And you mentioned earlier, you know, putting a, a you know at some point this is going to go away, and between now and then we have to like how do we how do we get to the point where things are changed? So moving beyond ourselves. What are some of the things leaders need to do once you kind of recognize that things need to move upstream, but we can't just send the police home right. and uh, let criminals do whatever they want with no justice while we put a whole bunch of money into the, you know, uh, to free counseling or something. Like it just doesn't work, doesn't work in reality like that. So where do we begin with making some of those shifts? Sure, um, you know, at, at some point, this does become a leadership action, right? Leaders have to change their mindset in, in order to, to, to take society or to take a community uh, forward or a police force forward into the future. Um, and it's, a, it's, a, it's a sort of a three-part mindset shift 
that I like to call con confront, confess, and consider. Um, I think the first thing a leader has, and, and this applies not just to pre-funding healthcare or pre-funding police, it, it applies to almost any, any leader who wants to be innovative any leader who wants to make things better. There's a lot of, there's a lot of leaders that want to make things bigger. I want a bigger company. I want bigger sales, but it's very different to want to make things better. You know, I want my product to be cheaper and better so more people can have it. You know, it, it, it's, it's hard to, to do that. Um, the confront is, is leaders have to, they have to confront the status quo that it's not good, that it's not acceptable. Now, again, this runs contrary, as so much leadership does, this runs contrary to our very nature, especially if we've been in a leadership role for a long time. We want to validate, again, our experience. I've done a good job. I'm a good police chief. I'm a good teacher. I'm a good doctor. But what we have to be able to do is we have to be able to have an aha moment where we confront the reality that it's not good enough. Our health system doesn't do a very good job for the elderly. Our police system doesn't work for minorities or for uh, those with addiction problems. It doesn't. And so we, we have to be able to confront that. And in, in some ways, it's a simple admission that I, as a leader, no longer will tolerate the status quo. This is what, this is what protests and riots are about. The status quo doesn't work. And so in some ways, and I'm not condoning rioting by any means, but in some ways, um, leaders need to become their own protesters. I am no longer satisfied with my profession. I'm no longer satisfied um, with the status quo. Um, once you do that, I think you can start to what I call confess that I can't do this alone that this is not about reforming myself or police just reforming the police force or, or just reforming hospitals or, or, or schools. But in fact, um, to really do this well, I've got to get others involved. Um, you know, I used to be the executive director of, of Habitat for Humanity in Sioux Falls. And, you know, it's interesting as we were looking at housing problems and, and housing for low-income families, you know, one of the things that the, the Habitat Board uh, had to, to confront is that we can't solve the housing crisis on our own, um, that we need partners and, and the solutions are going to lay outside of myself uh, or outside of, of my uh, profession. And then it sort of gets closed with what I call consider the unconsiderable, that if I really am dissatisfied with the status quo, and I really do recognize that others have to be involved. I also have to consider the fact that my profession, as I know it, may go away. Um, that to be a doctor will, in the future won't be what to be a doctor in the past was. Uh, to be a teacher in the future won't be the same thing as a teacher has been in the past. Um, and, and again, notice that all three of these are, are incredible acts of courage and humility. Mm -hmm. um, that, that it's not about us, it's not about me as the only solution, and that, in fact, everything that has made me feel good about my profession, maybe that's not right. You know, most of my profession, um, I've been an in-person lecturer and teacher, right, where I've had an audience that I can talk to face-to-face, -face. and uh, in today's world, I've had to learn that, you know what, maybe there's some times where virtual works better. Maybe there are some times where you don't need to fly me all around to, to show up. And in some ways, that's, that's um, bruising to the ego, you know, because um, it also means that I can train others to do what I do, or, or I'm just not as important as maybe I thought I was. And uh, so the, it, it's, in some ways, it sounds very simple. Um, it's not complicated to understand. It is humanly difficult to do is to embrace that humility and that courage that I want the status quo, including my profession, to change. But that's what leaders need to be able to do. Mm -hmm. That's what we need to be able to do. 
How do we help people get there? When you, when you talk about the, you know, the frontline cop, for example, or, you know, when you say that, I think of journalists and social media and how often, you know, like I've got a lot to say about how social media works. And then every once in a while, you see something from somebody who's living in a community and reporting on their own school board, for example. And you're like, yeah, that's better than anything that we did <laughs> as professional journalists because they were there, they were living it, they were honest, they were, you know, it was moving. Um, and you have to sit back and recognize that, uh, you know, what your role as a journalist is in the 21st century, which is very different from the days of, you know, Walter Cronkite. So, right. but with policing, especially, you know, when we look at this, these are people who were hearing say, you know, I'm tired of being attacked. The morale is down. I just want to get home at the end of the night. That's a, a huge thing you hear cops say. I want to go to work. I want to do my job. I want to, I want to make it home alive. Um, and that is, that is impacting everything they do. Right. Where does police reform come from? Does it come from police officers? Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's interesting. I, I mean, I think that there's, Clearly, there will be examples around the world of reform happening from every direction, right? From within, from without, from above, from below. You know, it's, um, I will say it is incredibly hard for um, any profession to transform itself from within. Mm -hmm. Because again, it takes, it takes this massive self-sacrifice that I want to get home alive. I want to spend time with my family. <laughs> And now you're telling me that everything I do needs to change. And so it, it, it is really hard uh, for uh, reform, again, whether it's police reform or what have you, it's really hard to reform from within. That would be ideal. That would be absolutely ideal. Um, I think that it puts an increased pressure on um, leaders within the profession um, to step up. And so whether it's police chiefs, uh, whether it's commissioners of law enforcement on the elected board, you know, de depends where it comes from. But I think we really need our leaders to to step up and to um, to start taking charge. They, they're they are best positioned. Now they can insulate themselves by involving the community writ large, what have you. Uh, I sometimes worry that these initiatives, where you get a citizens committee together or what have you they become sort of rubber stamps or they become lip service as opposed to real change. Um, because I think oftentimes these advisory committees do nothing but advise and then somebody else does the real work. So um, I think it squarely falls on the shoulders of, of leaders within a profession or within an organization. That said, there's a real social burden that falls on all of us. And I hate to say this because it's hard to get millions of people to, to do anything. But at some point, um, the public needs to become far more demanding and tolerant at the same time of leaders um, being vulnerable. We need our leaders to be able to say, your police department is not what it should be. You know, that's hard for a police chief to get up and say, you know, you know what, uh, you, you pay us good money, it's not what it should be. But, and so we, and, and, and we don't like politicians that change their mind. You know, I'm a law enforcement politician and you know what, it's not working. We gotta do something different. Um, the public needs to be more tolerant of leaders being able to change course and leaders being able to take, again, our schools, our universities, our, our hospitals, our, our police forces into a different direction. So we really need to, there's a social responsibility here um, to allow this to happen. Um, but it's it, it's leaders um, who have to, forgive the term, earn their pay. Um, they've been promoted to that leadership level. You know, if, if your job as a leader is to do nothing more than manage the status quo, um, you know, resolve problems, that's not much of a job. Um, you know, that's a, and in fact, if you do a good, if, you're, if your department or your hospital or your police force is running well, then a leader actually has no work to be done. Um, and so the real work of a leader, I believe, is to in fact dismantle the status quo and rebuild the future. Mm -hmm. And that's where the real work comes in. We often don't reward leaders to do that, um, but we need to start um, demanding that of our leaders and supporting our leaders as they do it. Talk a little bit about the timeline 
because I want to get into this idea. And one of the things in South Dakota this reminds me of is the Star Academy and juvenile corrections. So there's legislation that comes from Pierre about juvenile corrections. At some point, this, this place where kids are sent is going to close and the state is done being in this business. And there's a timeline when these other services that are going to help these families closer to their communities need to be spun up. Now in South Dakota, we've heard that, that the replacement of services was not as effective as people would have liked it to have been. And school and superintendents were saying, I've got no place to send this kid now and I've got no local services. But there is value in the sense that there was a desire to close down that place and say, you know, we're not gonna be in the business of housing kids hundreds of miles from home. We wanna help them and their families and their communities upstream. So talk a little bit about timing and taking away something and how do you make sure that the, the upstream services are there so when you take away the downstream funding, um, you don't have this problem where people right. are saying, what now? You just right. took away something from us. Yeah, it's, you know, it, uh, a lot of subjects there that we, mm -hmm. we can talk about. Um, I, I think the expiration date on the st status quo, we're going to stop this. You know, we're going to reduce our police force by 25%. We're going to close the, the Star Academy, what have you. Um, I think that's an essential component. You have to have a cliff that you are driving towards in order for people to take um, true reforms seriously. Now, it's incumbent upon the leaders to have enough runway and enough lead time towards that cliff that I can get into the air before I fall off. You know, so again, I, I think it's a it's a dual action that your timeline has to be long enough to give people breathing room. Um, to give them some time to, to figure out what those new replacement services are. Um, and I would argue that those replacement services, again, this becomes part of the funding challenge. You're going to have a bulge of funding for a while, where in some ways you need to, to make sure there's funding for the replacement service and for the existing service at the same time. Um, the way that, um, because the way to really make a current service um, expire effectively, like let's say the, the Star Academy, um, is that the replacement service needs to be a better option. Not just a tolerable option, but a better option. And so some of that actually takes that we're gonna design the new programs locally, we're gonna give them some, some time to get off the ground, we're going to give some time to test them and refine them. And so you do need, I think, a, a design phase for the replacement services. So let's say that we thought that we could reduce a police force by 15% if we had better domestic violence programs, better social intervention programs and what have you. Well, then what you need to do is, is set a timeline for we're gonna cut this 15%, you know, six years from now, five mm -hmm. years from now, whatever it is. But we're going to, in fact, be serious about getting um, domestic abuse programs up and running. And what does that tail? I do think that one of the problems that, um, that governments often have um, or communities have is that they, they throw the ball over the volleyball net, hoping someone will catch it. Mm -hmm. So it's easy for me to see I'm, I'm going to cut funding today. And I can make that, everybody knows I'm going to cut funding or, you know, five years from now. And it's going to be your local responsibility to take it on. But then often what that is, is it's just a volley, like, okay, figure it out. And the programs that get figured, either the ball gets dropped or the, the, the program that is designed is, is meager. So I, I, I actually believe in what, what I sort of call this reform czar concept that you actually create um, a position or you create a team or whatever that actually helps get the upstream services correctly in place so that they work and that there's mm -hmm. some real responsibility put on people's shoulders that if you're going to design that upstream service, there's some infrastructure in place to get it done, to yeah. get it done. I think you said a lot right there. We can bring that back to the, you know, the public health question of, you know, personal responsibility and a restaurant or a school district. 
um, being told to figure something out. And what we're hearing from people is just a, a massive amount of problems and zero infrastructure to figure those things out. And schools are trying to do their own contact tracing and everybody's confused. Um, something went wrong yeah. in this moment of saying that we had this all figured out and local control is important to the chaos that we're seeing locally in, in some of these days that we're seeing it. Right. Likewise, you know, in a neighborhood, if the police decide we're not going to, you know, we're not going to help downtown Sioux Falls with any crime anymore because they're on their own and, and it's your responsibility. Um, it's way more complicated than that. Yeah. And, and again, you know, you know, the, the buck, I think the buck has to stop somewhere, mm -hmm. you know, and the problem is, is that, you know, let's take a state like South Dakota a lot of our school districts or a lot of our businesses or what have you, they're not big enough to necessarily do it on their own, you know? And I mean, I, I again, going back to our sink, exer our, our sink exercise, <laughs> you know, the state is sitting on what, $900 million? Um, it wouldn't be that costly uh, to, to put sinks on every street corner. I mean, it, it just really wouldn't be that costly. And so, but again, we, we, we have this resistance, I think, to, uh, to sort of coming in and, and saying, look, let's, let's, let's really fund something broadly um, and let's, let's, let's quit quibbling about who controls or who doesn't control or, or, or what have you. I have a really favorite example of what I think of a program that I think works pretty well uh, that comes from Chicago. It's the Chicago public school system. There's federal money that's made available for nutrition for, for low-income kids. Um, and again, the government um, says it's for low-income kids, right? So most school districts across the country have a program in place where, you know, you have to apply and what's your parents' income and are you a poor child? And if you are, then you can get reduced or free breakfast or whatever the case may be. The city of Chicago got a waiver from the, from the federal government that and they proved that it was more money. It costs more money to figure out who was eligible for the program <laughs> than just to feed everybody. Uh -huh. And so, and quite frankly, there's some rich kids who get out of the, of the house in the morning without eating too, right? Uh -huh. And so they just provide breakfast. And you know, and I ran into this because we have grandsons in Chicago, and I, I took my youngest grandson to the to the kindergarten. This is how I found out about the program. And the first thing he did was pick up his lunch, hot or cold lunch. He could have his choice. And I, I was asking my, uh, my son-in-law about this. And he said, yeah, Chicago just gives him breakfast because every child does better with breakfast. So again, I, I think part of this problem is, is, is you know, we, we, we become overly concerned. Don't get me wrong. I love local control. But what is it that we're trying to control? And, you know, if, if, if we can do a better job of virtual education by, you know, having a centralized uh, video network that works, let's just do that. You know, let's just set up the video network, get everybody on board um, and start offering classes. You still can have local control by determining, do you offer um, virtual calculus to your kids or do you not, right? Mm -hmm. you, you can still have local control. But right now, we would say that every school has to figure out every class. Every school has to figure out every schedule. And sometimes it's just counterproductive. And we would be better off. It'd be cheaper for us just to say, you have the final control whether you partake or not. But you know what? We're going to provide breakfast for everybody. Or we're going to, you know, we're going to provide a sink for every, every restaurant or whatever the case may be. And, and we tend to get tied up in knots over really small issues. Hmm. Plus, if all the kids get breakfast, then nobody knows who's rich or poor at breakfast well, anyway. Yeah, the social the social yeah. benefit of not stigmatizing mm -hmm. children is huge, mm -hmm. right? right? And again, it's, it's a classic example of just moving some money upstream rather than funding, you know, the Office of Social Nutrition to determine who <laughs> qualifies. It's just like, you know what? Let's move money up to the kitchen and we'll right. just make an extra pot uh, you know, for everybody at the table and we'll be done. And yeah. we need to do more of that. And, and I think that, that- Because the goal is education. That's right. And right. unfortunately, yeah. I think we, we, often, we often equate local control um, as local struggle. You need to struggle locally to really have control. 
And we would be smarter to say, look, you don't need to struggle. Control is whether you participate or not, or or what have you. We'll give you a you know some, but but we make it hard at the local level. And I think we've <laughs> equated that that well, they got local control; they can figure it mm-hmm. out on their own. It's like you know what? There's just very little value there. Yeah. Mike Wagner, thank you so much for being here with us today. Uh, we look forward to having you back again. And the this column is that we're kind of uh, riffing on today is called Swimming Upstream, and it's on uncommonwisdom.org. You can read the, the whole thing there. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Laurie. It's a pleasure.